Okay, so for our um, last but not least speaker, um, we're gonna turn now to systems biology and genomic sciences, something that we cannot forget, which is critical for understanding the diversity of the populations that we're looking at, as well as understanding the overall omic level uh, changes that might point to unexpected correlates of immunity from infection. And so it's my honor now to introduce Rashmi Thomas, who's the chief of the Laboratory of Integrative Multiomics at the um, MHRP. And so I'm gonna pass the baton over to you, Rashmi, if you um, wanna take it away. Thank you, Galib. Um, so today I'm gonna to present about this gene signature associating with HIV vaccine efficacy and antibody effector function. So the broad aim of the study was to use unbiased approaches to identify the strongest correlates of vaccine efficacy in human samples in vivo. And for this, we used a transcriptome-wide RNA-seq method to identify a gene expression signature associating with vaccine efficacy in multiple non-human primate challenge studies that showed partial protection. And then we investigated immune responses associating with this signature, and then validated this in partially effective, futile human trials. So the r 26 base vaccine candidate showed partial efficacy against both SIV and SHIB challenge. And these studies were conducted by Dan Baruch and Janssen. And although these studies had um, differences, there was this commonality where uh, in both studies, the R26 on arm showed partial protection after six intrarectal challenges. So given this um, overlap, we asked if there were differentially expressed genes or gene signatures that associated with this protection at time points after vaccination, but prior to challenge. So we obtained uh, PBMCs, sorted them into CD4, CD8, NK, and B cells, and then using a computational method, asked if um, there were a collection of genes, so gene signatures, that were enriched in the uninfected animals compared to the infected animals. And we wanted to make sure that they were present in both studies. And we found one such signature which was enriched in the protected monkeys in both studies, both the 0911 in red and 1319 in blue. And we found them, uh, found the signature in sorted B cells. And we went on to show that the same gene signature was enriched in the uninfected monkeys in an independent arm of the 1319 study, which showed the most protection. So all these findings are from non-human primates. How about humans? And so for this, we turn to the RB144 study, which showed partial protection previously. The vaccine regimen is different, but that's what was there. And microarray data was available from PBMCs at two weeks after the fourth vaccine or the last vaccine. And we saw that this gene signature was present in the uninfected vaccinated people compared to the infected, um, the people that were infected. So we think that this is induced by vaccination because we didn't find this in the placebos. So what do we know about this signature? So the signature was previously identified in response to influenza vaccination when comparing B cells to monocytes uh, after day seven of flu vaccine, showing that this signature might be a broad indicator of effective vaccination. So our next question was to look at immune responses that associate with this gene signature. And uh, Dan Baruch and Galit Alter had generated a lot of immune responses for both the non-human primate studies. And we see that this gene signature associated with higher levels of this antibody effector function called ADCP. And you can see it being enriched uh, with high ADCP compared to low ADCP in both the 0911 and 1319 study. Again, how about in humans? And for this, we turn to the RV306 study, which was described previously by Jim. And here, this is also a study conducted um, in Thailand, an immunogenicity study, which, um, which used the same RV144 
vaccine regimen with some additional boosts. And we looked at time points two weeks after the RV144 series of vaccination and asked if um, there was an association with ADCP. And George here had uh, generated data, had generated ADCP data two weeks after the fourth vaccination. And here you can see that the signature is present uh, comparing high ADCP to low ADCP. And we also identified it at day three after the fourth vaccination. So to summarize these findings, this table shows you that shows you all the different vaccine regimens where we looked for this gene signature. And here, these all these studies had partial protection, and we see the presence of the protective signature, regardless of the vaccine regimen or the method. Now, Danny Tuark um, had generated RNA-seq data from HBTN505, which was a vaccine trial that did not show efficacy. And Slim Ferrari looked for this gene signature comparing vaccine uninfected to infected people. And he did not see this gene signature being enriched in HBTN505. And so we think that this gene signature might be a correlate of reduced risk of infection. And to explore this further, Shida, Shangwan, and my group made a composite gene expression score, which is really just the average expression of all the enriched genes in this gene signature in RB144, and asked if this was a reduced risk of, was it associating with reduced risk of infection in RB144? And we see that GES is associated with a lower risk of infection, and in comparison are the two immune correlates that were previously identified um, as associating with uh, risk of infection in RV134. So now all this gene expression data was generated in PBMC, so we don't really know the cellular origin of this gene signature. And to explore that, we went back to RB306, and we used this method called single cell site seq technology, where in addition to identifying mRNA transcripts using 10x genomics, we can also use cell surface antibody markers to quantitate um, the cell, cell expression um, on these different cell subsets. And here, this clustering is based on these cell surface markers. So once we did the clustering, we asked where are all these genes expressed? And these are the genes in the signature. And you can see that they're mostly expressed in myeloid cells, uh, specifically the monocytes. So I'm not going to go into this, but what I want to, uh, I hope I've convinced you is that this unbiased transcriptomic analysis can identify a protective gene signature associating with vaccine efficacy and ADCP, and we've seen this in multiple studies. And our hypothesis is that if this gene set is a true marker of HIV vaccine protection, we will not see it enriched in the HBTN702 trial that was futile. Now, how do we translate this and take it and look at other studies? Um, so this gene signature associates not only with vaccine protection, but also ADCP. And so it can be used to evaluate vaccine effectiveness even prior to challenge or infection. So currently we are looking at uh, if the signature will associate with ADCP in the approach trial. So that's a trial very similar where they used a vaccine regimen very similar to 1319, but this is a human immunogenicity trial. So really we think that omics approaches can potentially be used to assist with down selection of promising vaccine candidates in preclinical and early clinical trials supporting product development. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone involved in this work, particularly members of my lab, uh, leadership at MHRP, all our wonderful collaborators and the study participants. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Rashmi. That was great. Um, so let me ask you the first question, and then I'm going to ask the audience to put their questions in the um, Q&A box. We're going to try to have a bigger discussion uh, once you've asked Rashmi a couple questions. But so Rashmi, tell me, um, mechanistically, 
what is this gene set enrichment telling us? What is the, you know, what are the good responses doing? Is it, you know, programming the right help? Is it a flavor of help? You know, what, what do you think um, it's showing us mechanistically that we need to be paying attention to that might, we might be missing maybe with some of our current endpoint assays? So I think, you know, using this un unbiased approach, we are being able to pin down that this gene signature, which is associating with vaccine protection, also has an association with ADCP, which is an antibody uh, effector function, right? And I think also showing that the cellular lineage is something like monocytes tells us that maybe we have to um, focus on trying to, number one, I, I would want to see this showing up, um, you know, can we see this associating with ADCP in trials like the approach study, and then um, maybe try to see uh, if we can use such assays to fine tune um, responses from monocytes. Now, I'm not an immunologist, but I feel that there are um, things that can be done to get some of these genes, which we see are really associated with uh, vaccine protection, can we elicit those responses even more? So use specific adjuvants. And, um, you know, those are the type of things that I can think of, um, Galeed. Okay, great. Yeah. So, and, and, and I guess um, I'm going to ask you one more question. And I'm going to turn it over because I think Georgia has a nice question follow on to Peggy's question. Um, but I guess I'm going to ask you this question, Rashmi. So, so you know, I, I guess the issue is, is, you know, we're hearing a lot about heterogeneity in the virus. We're hearing about heterogeneity and in inflammation. We're hearing a lot about all these differences, right, in the microflora. Um, what are we going to, are, are we worried that this gene set might be confounded by diversity cross populations? Or do we think this might be a universal signature of inducing the right quality of immunity that we think could guide, you know, really, you know, any kind of vaccine development for HIV? Yeah, so you know, I, I think the whole thing is we want to try to elicit these responses, not just um, in some people, but right now the this particular gene signature is associating with partial efficacy, right? So among the people that did that were protected. So how can we um, make sure that we elicit this in all people? I think that's what we want to try to achieve. And um, right now we're only building more confidence. Is this something that really is associating with vaccine protection or not? And HVT and 705 really gives us that, um, 702 gives us that opportunity to go and test that. You know, is this really a correlate of vaccine protection and does it associate with ADCP? So I think that's something that we really need to look into and I'm hoping we can achieve yeah. cure. Well, I hope you'll do it both in 702 or 705. So I'm gonna yes. turn over to Georgia because I think Georgia um, has a question she'd like to ask you to broaden the discussion uh, to the whole panel. Great, yeah, and this this really stems from Peggy's always pushing us to what's practical, um, how do we really move things forward? And I think Rashmi, you just gave a beautiful outline of a, a new approach going forward. Can you can you kind of speak to that? Do you think the signature is ready now to apply to studies as a benchmark for new immunogen design? Um, and if not, which is likely, right? What are the what are the minimum studies or data that you would need to proceed? Such as you mentioned, you, know, you can look at this in HBTN seven hundred five and seven hundred six. Um, if the signature correlates with efficacy there, will that do it? Do you think it's ready then to implement this as a really good standard approach for immunogen design, or do you think other studies are needed? I, I think you know one thing would be to um, test it in seven hundred two first and really confirm that this is a signature associating with vaccine protection. I think we've shown that in 505. And then um, next after that, um, I, I think transfer it to studies like, uh, you know, we're doing that for approach. And how do we go on after that? I think is a bigger question, Georgia, which uh, I don't think I can answer at this point. I'm always step by step. But the cool thing about the Janssen studies is they always build one study over the other. They, they don't change too many things. So I think it would be very nice to test it across the different studies 
in uh, from Janssen. So we have the 1319 NHP study where we started out, we find the gene signature associating with vaccine protection. Let's build on, you know, approach other studies and see if you, this type of method is working. And maybe this signature associates with some flavor of vaccine protection. But when we see all together, it might be some other signature. So this is really this approach, this unbiased approach that I'm trying to put forth, uh, rather than just focusing on a specific gene signature. And I think things like time points, adjuvants, all those are very important. <laughs> and, you know, we were really struggling to find a study like 09 and 11 and, 11 and 13, 19, where they used the same vaccine regimen. But um, I think at this point with the Janssen studies, we have somewhere where we can build um, and look at many more uh, comparisons. Great, thank you. That, that's a perfect answer that this is really right now a conceptual approach and the details of that may change going forward. I see Peggy's got her hand up, so Peggy. Yeah, just to take that one step further, um, of course, doing a, a post hoc analysis once the study's done uh, in a blinded manner with case controlled studies would be very valuable. However, I would ask you, if you're given specimens as the trial is underway in a blinded manner, do you think you'd be able to predict who will be protected and not? Yes. Um, that would be so an acid test. I know. Uh, yeah. And we are already doing some prediction and we're able to, you know, even in the monkey studies, um, we, we see that we are able to predict those that go on to become infected versus uh, those are th that are not inf uninfected in the monkeys. And the hope is that we could apply this in the future. You know, such analysis can be applied in future studies to say who might based on their ADCP. So if you have high ADCP, then maybe those are the people who will respond to vaccination and not get infected, right? So that is really the hope, but these are things to be tested, Peggy. So I think there is some ways to go, but um, you know we have to start trying to use these uh, unbiased approaches to find the best candidates that can be used for such testing. Peggy, I think that that is an incredible idea, right? So there are, you know, obviously a lot of folks within this community that have a lot of, you know, ideas, not only about, you know, what mechanisms might be important, but what immunological signatures, including, you know, not microbiome signatures that could potentially give us information, even in 702, where we didn't see an efficacy signal, but could point to susceptibility of infection and potential, you know, lower risk in some populations. And so I think that this idea of doing an acid the test really, you know, validates the incredible effort that went into designing and executing that study. That would be such a waste not to have that move forward because that is what's going to give us the assays that you said are going to be actionable in the future. It's going to give us information about how we can basically deploy the tools that we have to break dogma. And I think it's really our responsibility not, you know, I think um, HIV has proven to us over and over again, that our hypotheses are possibly grounded in too much dogma. Um, but if I can, um, if I can just deviate for one second, I think that there was a really interesting question that Bill asked, as usual, he's stirring the pot. Um, and I would love to bring that up because I think that each one of you should probably answer this question in your own way. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to stick it to Daniel first, if that's okay, Dan. Um, but Bill is asking, um, since you're an immunologist, um, if you could speculate on whether FC function could ultimately contribute to a practical uh, vaccine protective response and what your take is on that, um, if, if you don't mind being the first guinea pig to try to answer his question. Well, I'll answer it. Um... And then I'm sure others will be able to contribute more, more thoughtfully. Um, but I think in the case of uh, a, a vaccine like uh, the AD26 uh, mosaic vaccines, where we know that there's uh, definitely not a neutralizing response that would be able to mediate protection, um, or that response is so uh, weak as to be undetectable in any assays, um, that you have to consider other immune functions. Um, and that the FC mediated ones have been repeatedly uh, linked to protection throughout iterative cycles of um, refinement of this regimen in, in preclinical models. 
I think there's a strong prospect for that being uh, indeed a, a mechanistic uh, way that vaccines could protect. Anybody else want to have a go at that? I think I was great, Dan. I can go out on a limb and say, yes, definitely. I think the FC function could protect in a vaccine, but I think um, the caveats are we need to be really careful about the breadth and function of those responses, is that we really need to map that to the circulating strains in the region. I think that this gets at all of our discussions earlier about the populations of viruses that are circulating in the vaccine match. So if we do that carefully with the immunogen design and, and score the, the FC functions that match um, both in specificity and then the breadth of function, but I also think we're going to need T cells. Um, and so whether that be CD8 T cells or a, a CD4 T cell response, I think we're going to need that in addition to FC function. Um, and then we wouldn't need breadth of neutralization. Yeah, uh, I, he said about how much FC function could <laughs> ultimately contribute anywhere between 50% and more. And he, even for the neutralizing antibody, according to David Ho, who's not exactly uh, the one that you bring up as a FC fan uh, of the field, he says that the, his study demonstrated that the, depending on the specificity of the broadly neutralizing antibody, you can have a 45% of the function related to the FC. And, and so I think that, the, as Georgia said, there is a, a, a huge room for improvement and the preclinical study are really, there are a, a few of them where FC mediated function have protected more than 50% of the animal. That is what I was referring as a 50%. But uh, let's not forget that uh, it takes a village to make a good antibody. So the CD40 cells are not irrelevant and I still think that having a good vaccine that can combine good CD8 and antibody functions is ultimately what we need against this okay. little yeah. sucker. So maybe, so maybe just because we have to move on to the closing, but I do want to just um, make a point that I think that you know we have dichotomized newt and non-newt too much in this field. I think that we as a community have to leave this meeting and to stop dichotomizing antibody function. There is not a fab separated from an FC. And I think what we've seen from so many other fields is the fact that, you know, there are non-neutralizing, which I hate saying, but functions on the back end of the antibody that contribute to neutralization of pathogens, right? So attenuating spread, controlling uh, viral entry, so on and so forth. So we have to stop doing this. There are, you know, um, neutralizing and FC functions that contribute together to clearance and control and blockade of infection. So I think that um, that is a really important point you made, Guido, about the fact that there is contribution of FC even to neutralization uh, and vice versa. Okay, so I, I'm gonna just take a minute just to say thank you. There are more questions, uh, panelists, uh, in the Q&A. Please take a minute and just answer them because they're really good questions and I wanna see the answers as well. Um, but with that, I'm gonna pass it over, I believe, to Jim.